In order to help prepare for the test, we're going to do a series of videos looking at the big concepts that we saw throughout this course, starting with descriptive statistics, where it all began. First thing we're going to do is we're going to review the different types of sampling methods. that you should be able to identify. The first type of sampling method that we used was simple random sampling. And that's where every person in the population is assigned a number and a random number generator. selects the participants. You might also see this where all the names are put into a hat and we draw a hat out randomly. It's the same idea. After simple random sampling, we looked for methods that were maybe a little more systematic. Systematic random sampling. With systematic sampling, we will choose one person randomly and then choose every, what we'll say, nth person after that. So this would be an example if we choose somebody randomly in the phone book, and then we choose every hundredth person in the phone book after that, and we keep going until we cycle through all the people. That gets us through all the people kind of in equal proportion. But sometimes we want the proportions to be representative of the population. And so if we want to break the population into groups, we might use stratified random sampling. And stratified random sampling breaks people into groups and chooses a proportion out of each group. The classic example here is if a population is 45% Democrat, 40% Republican, and 15% Independent, we'll split into those three groups. And then 40% of the responses respondents will be Republican, 45% will be Democrat, and 15% will be Independent. That's the stratified system to make sure every group is represented proportionally. Another way to handle the groups is what we call the clustered random sampling. And with clustered random sampling, we still break into groups and then we choose all people in a few random groups. So the example here is like if you're in a football stadium and we choose a couple random sections, and then every person in those sections are interviewed and surveyed. Technically, there's a fourth sampling method called convenient sampling as well. That's just where we go to whoever's accessible without much expense or work on our part. That's not really a random sampling method, so we're going to skip that for now. The second thing we did with descriptive statistics is we made polygons and ogives. to visually represent the data. Let's say we did a survey of students' GPAs. And let's say we looked at 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4.0 GPAs. And we looked at the frequency of those. There was one person who had a 0, three people who had a 1, two people who had a 2, five people who had a 3, and four people who had a 4. If I wanted to make a polygon of this information, We'll start the polygon one unit to the left of our data. And then we'll go one, two, three, four, and then one unit to the right of the data. The one unit to the left starts at 0. Then at 0, there was one person. At 1, there were three people. At 2, there were two people. At 3, there were five people. At 4, there were four people. 
and then 1 to the right goes back down to 0. And then we connect this with straight lines, which generates this polygon shape to our data. We do want to make sure we have titles and labels. So we might say student GPAs. We're looking at frequency on the x axis or on the y axis, and then GPAs on the x axis. Maybe I should have labeled them as 1, 2, 3, 4 for the GPAs. We also can make what's called an ogive graph. An ogive graph is very similar, but the difference is it's going to take a look at the cumulative frequency. To get the cumulative frequencies, we add the frequencies going down. So the first group only has one. The second group has three more, which brings it to four. The next group has two more, which brings it to six. Then five more brings it to 11. And four more brings it to 15. So the ogive is going to graph 1, 2, 3, 4. The ogive is going to graph the cumulative frequencies 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So again, we'll start 1 to the left at 0. Then 0 goes to 1. Then we get three more, which takes us to four. Then we get two more, which takes us to six. Then we get five more, which takes us to 11. Then we get four more, which takes us to 15. And so then we connect these lines. This one's pretty linear. Slight changes in the slope, but not anything significant. That is our ogive. Just remember, we need to write that it's the cumulative frequency on the y, GPA on the x, and then student GPAs giving it a title. Those are our polygons and our ogives, which allow us to visually represent a data set. Another thing we can do is we can represent a data set with a box plot to visually get an idea of what's going on. Let's say I've got some data. We'll say it's 1, 1, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 7, 7, 7, 7, 11, 15, and 19. With a box plot, we're interested first in where the middle of the data is. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 numbers. Half of 14 is 7. It's exactly 7. So we're going to be between the 7th and 8th value. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The 7th and 8th value split is right here between 5 and 7. So to get that middle value, we'll do 5 plus 7 divided by 2, which equals 6. 6 is our middle value. Then we need to find the middle that's below and above that middle value. So that's our quartiles, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's seven numbers. Half of seven is 3 and a half. So the fourth number is our first quartile. And then 1, 2, 3, 4 numbers is our third quartile. Then the other important numbers we need are the minimum and the maximum to build our box plot. Let's make our graph. We've got 0. Let's maybe go by 5s. 5, 10, 15, and 20. Then we'll put a dot for the minimum at 1, a dot for the maximum at 19, vertical lines for the quartiles at 4 and 7, and then a vertical line for the median at 6. And then we'll close off the box. And that's going to be our box plot, where every part of that box plot has 25% of the data. Don't forget, it does need a title. We didn't really say what this was, but maybe this is the box plot of our data. We should probably say what the data is and the values, but that'll do for this example. So box plots, another way to show data visually. But sometimes we don't want to show data visually. We want to represent the data with a numerical summary. So we could do that by describing the measures of center. Let's uh, look at the values of 12, 15, 17, 17, 14, and 11. 
To make this easier, I've copied the data into Excel. And so for part A, we're going to find the biggest measure center, which is the mean. The way we find the mean is you can type in equals average, open a parentheses, and select all the data values. And Excel will give us our mean of that entire data set is 14.33. But the other measure of center is the median. We can do median on Excel by typing equals and then median, and then open a parentheses and select the data values. And that tells me the middle number is 14.5. The other one is the mode. You might be able to see it by inspection. Or you can do equals mode and select the data. Just need to be careful. If there are multiple modes, Excel will give you the smallest of the multiple modes. It doesn't tell you what the next mode would be. So make sure you kind of do a glance at your data. Make sure you've got all your modes. So Excel makes it really nice to find those measures of center. The next thing that we took a look at with our descriptive statistics was measure of position, or where you are in relationship to all the other data. And we often used z-scores to represent that. With z-scores, we found out that z is equal to the value that we're interested in minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So for example, if the average GPA of a school is 2.8 with a standard deviation of 0 0.4, we can find the z-score of a student with, say, a 2.5 GPA. Using our formula, z scores what we're looking for. It's the number of standard deviations from the mean. The value is located from. We're interested in this 2.5 GPA student. That's our x. 2.8 is our mean GPA, so we'll subtract the 2.8. And then we'll divide by our standard deviation, which is 0.4. That's going to give us negative 0.75. It's negative, so that tells me that this student is below the average, and he's below by 0.75 standard deviations. One nice thing about standard deviations is they kind of give us an idea of how spread out the data is lumped around the mean using this thing called the empirical rule. The empirical rule says that 68% of the data is within one standard deviation. 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. And 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations. So going back to our GPA example, if the average GPA is 2.8 with a standard deviation of 0.4, we can draw a picture of how this information is lumped around the mean of 2.8. If we stretch out one standard deviation, that means we're going to increase by 0.4 to 3.2 on the right, decrease by 0.4 to 2.4 on the left. And we know that 68% of students are between a 2.4 and a 3.2 GPA. But we can extend out by another standard deviation. If I add another 0.4, we're up to 3.6. And if I subtract another 0.4, I'm at a 2.0. We know that 95% of students are between a 2.0 and a 3.6 GPA. Finally, we can go out to that third standard deviation by adding another 0.4 to get a 4.0 and subtracting another 0.4 to get a 1.6. And we find out that 99.7% of students 
have between a 1.6 and a 4.0 GPA. That's our empirical rule. This video was a quick summary of what we saw talking about descriptive statistics. Our next video is going to take a look at the next section of our class, which was the probability.